Hello, my name is Alex Isles and welcome. In today's episode we're going to be discussing where did the Northumbrians come from? Welcome back. I hope you'll enjoy today's episode. We're going to start a brand new series looking at the Kingdom of Northumbria. So from up here right the way down to here, this is the Kingdom of Northumbria, which is a Dark Age or early medieval kingdom that existed. We're going to be discussing its kings from the first king of Benicia, Ida, right the way through to the end of the Iding dynasty. So focusing specifically on them, but we're going to look at other topics as well. What I wanted to do was to start off talking about where the Anglo-Saxons came from and the various different stories behind that. So if you love all of that, why don't you subscribe now and we'll just get right into it. So just behind me right here, I have the Anglo-Saxon migration traditional view. Now this traditional view comes with the idea of the late Roman period. So at the end of the Roman period, what we have is that uh, the, the Roman government collapses around about 410 AD. And then we know from other sources, such as sources across in uh, Gaul, at that time Roman Gaul, that there were various missionaries who came across to Britain to continue to deal with uh, Christian heresies, such as the Christian her heresy of Polygiasm. And when you have the Christian heresy of Polygiasm, they would send over missionaries to deal with that. And it shows an image of a continued Romano-British way of life, but with a lot more regionality. So what it seems is that various different strongmen, uh, diocese governments, and also alongside this auxiliary commanders, took over the place of the centralised Roman government. When they took over the, from the traditional Roman government, life continued as it was. And so when life continued as it was, there are good examples of this. For instance, at um, Bert Oswald's Roman fort on Hadrian's Wall, where there appears to be a hall that was built over an old granary. And it has coins from the 4th century um, proving that this was in use in the late Roman period and then seems to continue to be in use into this period that we call the Early Middle Ages, or some people still call the Dark Ages. When you've got that going on, there appears to be a period of nearly, um, in some places, up to 100 years of continued Romano-British lifestyles. But in about the 450s in the south, we have an issue. And this issue is that there is a British tyrant or dictator by the name of Vortigern. Now, Vortigern needs to hire some troops, so he hires the semi-mythical Hengist and Horsa. They come across, they start working for him, and he uses a very similar method to how the Romans employed their troops. Now, we have a really interesting um, summary of all of this in a book called The First Kingdom by an archaeologist called Max Adams. And Max Adams is fantastic at bringing together all the sources, and I'll just summarise his work. But what Max suggests is that in the late Roman period, many troops were given a deal where there would be an amount of pay, but alongside this as well, the army was expected to supply your weapons, your clothing, and your accommodation. And this was a part of the package that a late Roman soldier received. So Hengist and Horsa expect this package as a part of the deal they have from Vortigern. This deal goes sour when Vortigern doesn't supply his end of the bargain. When he doesn't supply him his end of the bargain, Hengist and Horsa challenge him on it and say, look, you need to pay up. You have not supplied your end of the bargain. We want this dealt with. When they say that, what happens is that uh, Vortigern obviously can't pay his side and they revolt against him. When they revolt against him, they then call on relations from across in the Germanic world. And then you start seeing them coming in, which eventually results in Vortigern's death Horsa's death, and then Hengist becomes the first king of the Kentish. Then we see more and more Anglo-Saxons moving across into Britain from the 450s onwards into the point where we start seeing the early Anglo-Saxon kingdoms form. So this is the traditional view, and then it's backed up again by Bede's Ecclesiastical History of the English People, where he mentions three races of the Anglo-Saxons, which he refers to as the Angles, the Saxons, and then the Jutes over here as well. So those as the traditional view of where the Anglo-Saxons come from. What we'll do now is we're going to move on to the second view proposed by Max Adams and also other members as well of his group, the Benician 
research group or the Brinick research group. So right here we have the second theory and this theory is the Brinick theory. Now the Brinick theory or as it would look like if you just read it in normal English the Benicia theory is working on the concept that there were already pre-existing Germanic troops within the British Isles. Now this is proposed by an archaeologist called Graham Young and is also mentioned as well by Max Adams. So again it has other proponents who back this up. Now the idea is, is that in the um, late Roman period, so from the late 3rd century onwards, we start seeing more and more settlement of Germanic troops within the British Isles. Some of these troops would have been from defeated Germanic tribes who were defeated on the Rhineland. And when they were defeated on the Rhineland, they would be brought back over. So for instance, we know that Constantine Chlorus had at least two Germanic tribes with him um, in Britain. And then when he passed away, his son Constantine was proclaimed emperor by those troops alongside the legions in Britain. We also have evidence of Frisian troops on Hadrian's Wall. Now these Frisian troops can be found at Rochester um, Fort on Hadrian's Wall, at Housted's Roman Fort, at Bird Oswald there's evidence for Frisian troops as well, and there's also evidence from Vindolanda of Frisians at the Fort too. So when we have these different troops we can see there are Frisians up there. We also know from at least the 400s onwards there were also Anglians in Lincolnshire and we have this very famous forts down here, the Saxon Shore Forts. Now the Saxon Shore Forts cause all sorts of discussion because they are 4th century in construction and there's all sorts of the debate of were they an actual defence or instead were they just called that because of the fact they were settled with Saxons. We're not entirely sure. What we do know is that they're under the command of the British forces in the Notita Dignatum, which is a late Roman document. So there could be Saxons stationed on the Saxon shore forts and it's named after them, or it could be a defence against the Saxons. I would probably go more into the camp of believing that there are Saxon troops stationed there. And then alongside that as well, you're starting to see an early Anglian settlement from possibly as early as the 400s in Lincolnshire. And alongside this as well, we have Frisian troops, as well as other Germanic tribes such as the Batavians and the Tungrians, also on Hadrian's Wall as well. So that suggestion is that there are pre-existing Germanic troops here. Now what the Benician research or Brinich are suggesting is that there was actually a kingdom that formed around the Tyne, Tyne Valley right here called Brinich. And Brinich was basically described as they believe, and this is pro propagated by the archaeologist Graham Young, is that basically that uh, name Brinich means the passes of the mountains or the mountain passes. And when it's the mountain passes, he says, well, we've got the Pennines right here. And then alongside that, we've also got the Cheviots just above them right up here. So when you've got the Cheviots and the Pennines in the area, well, the Tyne Valley right here is a little gap between those two ranges of hills. So when you've got that in between, he propagates that the Tyne Valley was then heavily Germanic at the end of Roman Britain because of the number of Germanic troops that had been stationed in that area. When there were lots of Germanic troops in those areas, they then formed a post-Roman kingdom, which is the kingdom of Brinich. Now, when the kingdom of Brinich's there, as you go through the Roman period, they would have fought against other post-Roman successor kingdoms, such as the kingdom of Eborach, which is, of course, Yorkshire, and also the kingdom of uh, Reged over here, the kingdom of Gogodin up here, and also the kingdom of Dalatia and also Dumbarton over on the west coast of Scotland. So you've got lots of surviving kingdoms. Then, from that kingdom there, that's the kingdom where you suddenly see Ida, of the first of the Idings dynasty, then taking his troops from here and going up to Bambra, which is just around this area here, and taking Bambra from a pre-existing uh, British dynasty, which lived up in that area, and then taking this area and starting to form the beginning of what we would see later on as the uh, foundation of Benicia, the northern part of the Kingdom of Northumbria. 
So that's the second theory, that the Germanic troops that the Romans had brought over from the 3rd into the 4th century then stayed in the area, became a post-Roman successor kingdom, and then that became the foundation for expansionism by individuals like Ida in the later periods. Let's have a look at the third theory. So, right here we have the third theory. Now this is a bit similar, and it's a bit of a mix of the first theory and a mix of the second theory. And this is the concept that what happens is you take some of the first theory, the idea of a, a character such as Vortican inviting over troops into the British Isles and then their troops rebelling against him. When those troops rebel against him, they call upon their relations and then they come over and start settling. And so the idea is, and this is put forward by um, archaeologists and historians such as people like Catelyn Green, and she points out that there is a large Anglian settlement in Lincolnshire. When there's large Anglian settlement in Lincolnshire, it's from the early 400s. So they come across from the area that is sort of like central Denmark here, they come across into Lincolnshire, and then they develop a large base right here. When they develop a large base, they have larger families, they settle in the area, the land is good, and then they start to expand. And so when they start to expand, you see them move into East Anglia, and they come up north into what would be the kingdom of Deria, or the old kingdom of Eberach, which is from Eberachum, the Roman name for York. Then they take over that and it becomes Deria, and so you have an Anglian settlement there, and then uh, some of them will come up into Brinich which is obviously Bernicia, the Anglo-Saxon northern half of the Kingdom of Northumbria. From that, that would some, be someone like a prince such as Ida, who takes his warband, makes an assault on Bambra, takes Bambra, which is its Britain name here, British name here, is Din Goyer, from the Britons, and then starts his dynasty up there. Now this theory does have some weight as well, because we have the island of Lindisfarne, so just there where my finger is, there is a tiny wee island which is just off the coast, and this is Lindisfarne, which twice a day is made an island by the tides coming in. When that's there, the British name for Lindisfarne is Merkat, or the, holing, or the healing island. So when it's the healing island, that would have already had some significance probably to the pre-existing um, northern British who lived in and this around this area of the former Vortadini and Gogodon kingdoms. So they were in and around that area. But the English name for it is not Merkat, it is actually Lindisfarne. And Lindisfarne comes from the Anglo-Saxon name for Lincolnshire, which is Lindsay. So when you have Lindsay, this is then a, likely a settlement of Anglians from Lincolnshire is settling on the holy island of Merkat, and it becomes Lindisfarne. And then you get the name for Lindisfarne. And so the name for Lindisfarne comes from Farn meaning island, and Lindy meaning Lincolnshire, or the Anglo-Saxon kingdom of Lincolnshire. So because of that, there would have been settlement from that kingdom there, they would have come up, settled on the island, and then they've given their name to it. So it's possible that the Anglians then expanded up the coast, took over that area, and Ida was a prince descended from Anglians who had come over in the early 400s, settled in Lincolnshire, and then had taken other areas in and around the area to create his new Benician kingdom, the northern half of Northumbria. So it's a really interesting one there. So we have this sort of beginning of the kingdom of Northumbria, and we have to understand ourselves which of the three theories seems more likely. Do we go with the traditional from the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle and Bede's Ecclesiastical History, which says about the idea of like Anglians, Saxons and Jutes coming over after the failed diplomacy between Hengist, Horsa and Vortigern? Do we look at pre-existing Roman troops in the British Isles, which have been here since the Roman period, have grown up in the area? If you've seen my pre-existing video on the Anglo-Saxon migrations, I refer to this as well, about there may have been generations who already existed and grew up in Britain, and they had British accents on their Germanic dialects. So, you know, there is a possibility that there are pre-existing Germanic troops in the British Isles from the 3rd and 4th centuries that then formed the post-Roman kingdoms, and it wasn't too hard a step to form the Anglo-Saxon kingdoms after the fall of Roman Britain. 
or is it the third theory where the area of Lincolnshire here was the, the cradle of the Anglian settlements and the early Anglians took over this area and then started forming the Anglian kingdoms that stretched down the east coast of Britain from East Anglia right the way up to eventually Edinburgh forming the Anglian or the Anglian kingdoms that we see there. The Saxons take over the south coast and the Jutes take over Kent. It could be a mix of all three theories, and obviously, like everything in history and archaeology, it requires debate, research, and understanding, and that's what makes it so fun. So I hope that maybe in the comments section you tell me which theory you like the most. Are you like a traditionalist? Are you a Benician? Possibly a wee bit more like myself? Are you a follower of the Lincolnshire theory? I would love to know, and then we can start a debate there. As always, please do like and subscribe if you haven't already done so. Share the video with your friends if you'd like to support me further. I do also have a Patreon and I also provide guided tours as well. So if you're ever in the Northeast and you'd like to talk more about this, why don't you book one of my tours on www.islestours.co.uk. In the meantime though, stay safe and well and I hope you'll join me for another video in the near future as we explore more of the history of Northumbria. In the meantime though, stay safe and well and thank you so much.